Welcome to stage 12 of Misspoke, a cycling podcast going out during the coronavirus pandemic. I hope you're not too badly affected by coronavirus, and I hope that this little podcast will give you some uh, few modicums of entertainment and enjoyment during this difficult time. And I'm going to start stage 12 with a short story. And I suppose I should say, first of all, with profuse apologies to J.K. Rowling, this is called Harry Potter and the Order from Wiggle. Harry Potter sat in his room at Hogwarts, surfing the internet on his iPad. Ron Weasley was lying on the bed, gazing at the mirror on the ceiling, while Hermione was sitting on the rug, scrolling through her garment. Have you heard of Wiggle? Harry said. Professor Snape had one, said Hermione. It's a magic wand. All wands are magic, said Harry. Anyway, this isn't a wand. It's a website for cycling stuff. It's not just cycling, said Ron. They also do running and swimming and triathlon stuff. Shut up, Ron, said Harry and Hermione in unison. Harry scrolled to the section with lights. The Nog Blinder rear light looked neat and it was only 1999. I'm buying a light, said Harry. Get a tea light, said Hermione. They're pretty. I'm not getting a tea light. This is a real light. USB charger, 44 lumens, five different modes, 50 hours in eco flash, 100% waterproof, gets good reviews. What do you want a real light anyway, said Ron. You haven't even got a bike. Shut up, Ron, said Harry and Hermione together, and they giggled. Harry created an account and paid with Professor Dumbledore's PayPal account, which he had hacked earlier. A few days later, a DPD driver drew up at the gates of Hogwarts and rang the bell. The heavy gates swung open, and there stood Hagrid, his giant frame astride a giant frame, filling the doorway, his big bearded face staring down at the driver. What do you want? he roared. Package for Potter, said the driver. Sign here, squire. He held out the little handheld device. Hagrid's enormous hand closed around it, and with his clumsy fingers he clasped the stylus and scribbled his name on the slippery surface. The driver peered at the screen. What's that say? he said. Hagrid, said Hagrid. Are you blind? Is that a first name or a last name? It's a name, roared Hagrid. Now get lost. No need to be rude, squire, said the driver. Just doing my job. Hagrid let out a terrible bellow and ran at the transit van and pushed it off the drawbridge. It tumbled over and crashed to the ground far below, parcels scattering everywhere. That was silly, said the driver. I had a parcel for Hagrid. Hagrid found Harry playing Quidditch and gave him the parcel. Harry ripped it open, found a little packet of sweets and gave it to Hagrid. Here, said Harry, have some Hagribo. It's not Hagribo, said Hagrid, putting the whole packet in his mouth, plastic and all. It's Haribo. Can't you read? Harry tore at the packaging, but he could not open the plastic wrapped around the light. Hagrid tried, but he also couldn't get through the hard plastic. Malfoy came past. He couldn't do it. Professor McGonagall likewise tried and failed, as did Professor Snape. Anyone seen Voldemort? asked Harry. He's good at packaging. They went and found Voldemort, who was sitting on the battlements watching cat videos on his iPod Touch. Voldemort pointed at the packaging with his wand and whispered a spell. The package sprang open. What was that spell? asked Harry. Voldemort said, That is a secret known to very few, Harry, and you are not one of them. Harry made a face. He attached the light to his cloak and switched it on. The bright red 44 lumen light pulsed through the gloom. Harry tried the different modes, standby, fast flash, organic flash slow, organic flash fast, eco flash. Nice light, said Ron. Shut up, Ron, said Harry. And I say again, with apologies to J.K. Rowling. The Misspoke podcast is described as cycling culture, cycling and culture. Most of what we've heard so far in all stages, stages, stages 11, 11 stages 
of the Misspoke podcast have been all my work, Julian Hutchings. So perhaps it's time for a slight change. So I thought I'd introduce one of my one of my favourite poems, which made a deep impression on me as a young man. I can't entirely say why. It's just one of those poems that I always liked. So I thought I'd share it with you today. It's called Let Me Die a Young Man's Death, and it's by Roger McGough. Let me die a young man's death, not a clean and in-between-the-sheets holy water death, not a famous last words, peaceful, out-of-breath death. When I'm 73 and in constant good tumour, May I be mown down at dawn by a bright red sports car on my way home from an all-night party. Or when I'm 91 with silver hair and sitting in a barber's chair, may rival gangsters with ham-fisted tommy guns burst in and give me a short back and insides. Or when I'm 104 and banned from the cavern, may my mistress catching me in bed with her daughter and fearing for her son cut me up into little pieces and throw away every piece but one. Let me die a young man's death, not a free from sin, tiptoe in, candle wax and waning death, not a curtains drawn by angels born. What a nice way to go, death. And now another one of my affectionate cycling monologues. I always wanted a tandem, and being 64, am I too old for a tandem? Well, maybe I am, and... Maybe I'm not, but this particular monologue is called The Tandem Riders. So anyway, I got this tandem on eBay. It's amazing. It's like steel and that. I got it from this old bloke. Used to be good in his day. Maybe you've heard of him. Bob, I think his name was. Anyway, he was a face in the 60s and won like races and championships and stuff. You must have heard of him. Look, here's a photo of him on his tandem. Anyway, I always wanted a tandem. It's like a bicycle built for two. And I can go out on it with my girlfriend if I can persuade her to go with me. She'll love it. She only gave it a try. The thing with the tandem is once it gets going, the momentum is like massive. So you can really motor on the flat. Of course, it's useless on the hills because it weighs loads. I mean, it's steel, isn't it? And the brakes aren't that good, to be honest. It's a death trap. I don't know why anyone would want one. My girlfriend won't go on it with me. She hates cycling. Probably hates me too, if I'm honest. But the record for London to Brighton and Land's End to John O'Groats is like really quick because you can go much faster on a tandem if there's two of you and you work well together in unison, if you know what I mean. I love it. It's like a blue colour. Well, it is blue. And the person at the back, they're called the stoker. Did you know that? They can't see much, really. Just the back of the person in front. That's the one who does the steering and changes the gears and gives the signals and has all the fun, really. The person at the back, it's shit, really. You can't see a thing. I'd hate to be the stoker. Not that that's very likely. Who do I know who'd go on a tandem with me? Not my girlfriend, that's for sure. She hates cycling. And no one else wants to ride with me. I don't know why I bought it, really. I hate it. The thing weighs a ton. And there's nowhere to keep it. It's too big and unwieldy. Maybe before the war, a tandem was a good thing. But not now. I saw two blokes on a tandem the other day. They looked like they were friends and having a good time. I wish I knew someone like that. I'd go with my girlfriend, but she left me. She hates cycling. I'm going to put it on eBay. Get some money from it. Let someone else have the hassle. Serve them right. Hope they break their necks. I fancy an electric bike. And now a further extract from my autobiographical memoir called My Life in Bikes. And if you're interested in reading this, or interested in reading any of my stories, really, um, you can find them on Amazon. Just search for my name, Julian Hutchings. Anyway, we've reached uh, 2013 in My Life in Bikes, and this is a Planet X TT bike. But there was more to cycling than club runs and sportives and grinding up Mont Ventoux. What about time trialling? Time trialling is a very British cycling event, steeped in history and mythology, with its own language and rituals, its high priests and evangelists, its heroes and villains. But most of all, it required a time trial bike, and I didn't have one. Yes, I could have used the Cervelo or even a Bianchi at a pinch, But no one achieved a decent time on a road bike. That was well known. You needed a TT bike with a special scaffolding on the front and disc wheels, a stubby saddle and a special helmet and shoe covers for the full aerodynamic effect. I was a man on a mission. Planet X made a whole range of TT bikes and they were regarded as good value by those in the know. Plus, they had go-faster names like Exocet, named after a missile developed by the French and used in the Falklands War. What could go wrong? 
I was determined to get into time trialling, so I ordered one. Black. A stealth bomber like a silent assassin. No one would see me coming. They would just hear the swish of my carbon wheels as I flashed past them and clocked up times that had never been seen in the club. It arrived in a box. Is there any excitement greater than opening a box which contains a new bicycle? I fear not. It was low and sleek and fearsome. This surely was my ticket to the small times in the big time. My first ride on it was to be on the West Wickham TT circuit. Start at the traffic lights by the station, turn left, left at the roundabout, past the golf course, left at the roundabout, past the big houses, left at the Chinese roundabout, over the next roundabout, past the school, under the railway bridge, left at the next roundabout, up the small rise and finish at the lights. 3.2 miles of lung-busting effort and watch out for buses, cars, people, school kids, pedestrians and other racers. I kitted up and set off. It was strange. Getting down on the TT bars hurt my back and looking up hurt my neck and being bent double meant that I had trouble breathing. The little TT handlebars felt too narrow and I lacked control. On these suburban streets with their many roundabouts and wandering children, that was not a good look. But boy, was it fast. I finished the circuit, went home and checked my Strava time. A PB! But, but, it wasn't for me. I was too old for these contortionist poses. Too stiff for this bending. Muscles too locked up for this level of suppleness. And not enough years left in the tank or desire left in the brain to want to spend time training and teaching my body to do what was needed. And let's face it, I was 55. I wasn't a tt not really. Not for me, the 5am starts on desperate B-roads in the back of Sussex, the drafty damp village halls, the half hour of effort to shave seconds off last week's time, the slow drive home to find the wife still in bed. I went on the club website and offered it for sale. Only three miles covered, pristine condition, never raced or rallied. But I got no offers. Now I had five bikes. A Cervelo, the Roberts, the Planet X winter bike, the Bianchi and the Planet X TT bike. Clearly there was something missing. Moulton, 2013. Cycling for me was never just about riding bikes. It was about all aspects of cycling and included books, films, watching it live and on television, the kit, the history, the iconography, the great names, copy, Bartali, Binder, Pantani, Ankatil, Eno, Merckx, Indurain, Armstrong, yes, Armstrong, etc. And the great brands, Campagnolo, Look, Raleigh, Peugeot, City, Bianchi, and, and Moulton. Who, even if they had no interest in cycling at all, had not heard of Moulton? Designed by Sir Alec Moulton, who had worked on the design of the Mini, small wheels, suspension, dismantleable, or foldable frame, and uh, small wheels. It was iconic, rare, and naturally I had to have one. Moulton stood outside the mainstream of cycling, and particularly the sort of road cycling, as I had fallen in love with it. It was more a cult than a brand, owned by people who had owned one for years and had their own club, the Moulton Owners Club. They called themselves Moultoneers which met regularly when old men in plus fours and anoraks with big sideburns and bushy beards, usually childless and wifeless, real ale and red wine drinkers, went for a ride together and discussed the finer points of small wheels and anorak toggles. They were still available to buy new, but fiendishly expensive, so I kept an eye on eBay until one came up for sale. I put in a bid and, much to my surprise, I won. I went to collect it, somewhere near Twickenham, Moneyed, obviously, with a molten collection in the garage, but this one surplus to requirements for dark reasons. It was a beautiful bike. Dark blue, shiny, lustrous, unmarked. Drop handlebars, Campagnolo group set, I forget which one. Small wheels, did I mention those? And fitted easily into my car. This wasn't a foldable model, although I believe it could be split in the middle like my Roberts with its S&S coupling, but it fitted into the boot. I took it home and put it in the garage with my other bikes. And it looked fine, very fine indeed. But what did you do with a Moulton? Yes, I could ride it, but I rode with the club and we rode race bikes. We were racers, even if I wasn't really. And I seldom went out on my own. I didn't commute. I had a company car and I was a company director. 
I didn't go to the shops on my bike. I walked or I drove. So options were limited. I rode it a couple of times and it rode nicely and looked fabulous, like a molten, not surprisingly really. But I didn't have the molten passion. And although I joined the Molten Club and received their quarterly and ineffably dull magazine, I just couldn't be part of the cult. I thought it should go to someone who would appreciate it, so I put it up for sale on eBay. At least I thought it was an investment and I should make a shitload of profit on it. I'd paid a thousand pounds for it, so I put it up for sale with a starting bid of a thousand pounds and sat back and waited for my bank balance to fill up. I got one bid for a thousand pounds. And eBay rules being what they were, that's what I sold it for. So at least I didn't lose money, if you don't count the commission. And hopefully the next owner gave it the dedication and love which I could not manage. And he had sideburns. And now a word from my sponsor. Actually, I don't have a sponsor. So if anybody knows a big or small or medium size or companies on the brink of bankruptcy that are looking to sponsor a minor podcast by the name of Misspoke, then please get them to get in touch. So I thought I'd choose some uh, brands or cycling items that I particularly like for various reasons. And the one I've chosen for stage 12 is a Castelli jersey, which is called or used to be called the Gabba, but is now called the Perfetto. It came out about oh, six, seven years ago and was first seen being ridden by pro cyclists in the peloton at Milan San Remo on a particularly cold and wet and snowy edition. And then it got released to the public. And what is it? Well, it's a cycling jersey made of some very precise windstopper fabric, which is not exactly waterproof, but it's certainly showerproof. But what it is, is windproof. Now, it was made originally as a short sleeve jersey, then they made a long sleeve jersey, and then they made a uh, jersey with removable sleeves, and then they made a gilet. And they're all made of the same fabric. And then they introduced a Perfetto light version, which has the same kind of windstopper fabric but slightly lighter for use in spring or even summer so long as it's not too hot and uh, it used to be called the Gabba they've now changed the name for some reason to Perfetto and it is the most perfect cycling jersey or the most uh, adaptable and versatile cycling jersey I would say that I've ever worn I have two short sleeve versions, a long sleeve version and a gilet. And there are few cycling trips where I wouldn't put at least one, if not two, uh, Perfetto jerseys in my suitcase because they are so useful. They keep you warm, they keep you dry, they keep you cool, they are comfortable, they have nice pockets, they are just a wonderful, wonderful cycling garment. Highly recommended. And now we've reached the next chapter in my novella about the Liège Baston Liège Sportive, which is called The Monument. And if you've missed the previous chapters, then make sure you catch previous stages of the Misspoke podcast. We've now reached chapter nine. The morning was bright but cold and a fine mist lay over the streets, which was still empty. Clovis and Eric prepared their bikes in silence. Clovis had fidgeted over which bike to bring and eventually settled on his giant because of the disc brakes and tubeless tyres, while Eric rode his sole bike, a trek, which was his pride and joy. They wore arm warmers and leg warmers because of the weather, and Clovis had a buff around his neck and another on his head beneath his helmet. Eric, despite his bald head, always rode without any head covering under his helmet, and claimed not to feel the cold there, although he did everywhere else, and was seldom seen without leg warmers until midsummer, and even then it was rare to see his spindly legs. Clovis had mapped a route on ride with GPS before leaving home, and he loaded it up now on his Wahoo, a 45-mile spin around the countryside of Liège, including part of tomorrow's route that would bring them back to the centre of Liège, ready to sign on at three and collect their ride numbers. They set off through the silent village and shortly turned off into the countryside. It was unlike the English countryside. 
They passed through not quite villages, not quite suburbs, not quite single dwellings. The houses were recent in a range of styles, immaculately kept, and there was not a scrap of paper or litter on the verges or hanging from bushes. No sweet wrappers casually tossed from car windows as seemed to blight the area of Kent in which they lived. The land was rolling. Some hills, but nothing too challenging. The roads neat and well kept, without the slew of potholes they were used to. The few cars who passed them or came towards them were respectful, gave them plenty of space, waited for them at junctions, and no one called them a cunt or shouted out of the window at them to ride single file, which they were anyway, or to get off the fucking road. Perhaps the absence of BMWs had something to do with it, but no one raced past them in blacked-out windows with a Brexit sticker on the bumper and tried to knock them off with a backdraft from their diesel engine. Eric's pace was steady yet unspectacular, He had never been quick and wasn't about to start now, but he had stamina and could keep going if he felt like doing so. They had chosen the hundred-mile route for Saturday's sportive. Eric thought he could make it if he paced it well. But it would be close. It included 10,000 feet of climbing and was relentlessly up and down all day, probably the hardest of the monuments. The year before they had ridden Amstel Gold and the year before that Paris-Roubaix with its scary cobbles and the year before the Tour of Flanders with its short steep climbs, its massive crowds and its cobbles and dark beer. Eric had managed them, cursing and panting, yes, but he had done it and ticked another one off his bucket list. Clovis hated the idea of a bucket list but he still ticked off the climbs and kept a tally in his notebook. The land was gentle and rolling and they mainly rode in silence as they usually did once the ride had started, each lost in his own thoughts or none at all, just the road and the bike and the wheels and the land and the sky, the spin of the pedals and the reassuring sound of tyres on tarmac. Once as they crested a hill, Clovis, in front as he usually was on the climbs, looked behind and thought he saw a blue Skoda some distance back, not moving, just parked by the side of the road. You see that Skoda? he said to Eric, who laboured up the hill and paused at the top. No, what Skoda? The one we saw at the petrol station. I thought I saw it. They both looked back. The roads were bare of blue Skodas. I I could have sworn, said Clovis. You're imagining it, said Eric, taking a swig from his bottle. Maybe, maybe not. They stopped in the next village that had a bakery and a few tables, and Clovis ordered a coffee and a pastry. Diet, said Eric. I'm riding said Clovis. I can eat what I want. Not entirely, said Eric. You don't burn nearly as many calories cycling as you think you do. And foods generally have far more calories than they think they have. It's a frightening combination. Tell me about it, said Clovis. I am telling you about it. It's an expression, said Clovis. It really means don't tell me about it. Anyway, I'm hungry. The world is full of fat people who are hungry, said Eric. Christ, Eric, give me a break. I'm comfort eating. Why? I'm nervous. That's a mistake too, and it won't make you less nervous. The route took them into the centre of Liège down a long, sweeping, twisting descent before hitting the main road alongside the River Meuse. You realise that if we ride to the start and back tomorrow, we have to climb that hill with a hundred miles in our legs, said Clovis. I'm trying not to think about it. They crossed the river and passed through an industrial estate. There's an island in the middle called Outre Meuse, said Clovis. George Simenon was born there. Who? said Eric. Simenon, one of the few famous Belgians. He wrote the Maigret books. Oh, Rowan Atkinson. Eddie Merckx, he's the most famous Belgian. Oh, and Tintin, Ilio Kaiser, Jesper Steuven, Thies Benut. You can't just name Belgian cyclists. That doesn't count. Why not? They're famous in my world. Greg Van Avermaet, Thomas Ahen, Patrick Gilbert, Patrick Gilbert. Patrick Gilbert, Patrick Circu, said Clovis, rest in peace. Jacques Brel, said Eric. Great songwriter, said Clovis. Not a cyclist, far as I know. Great singer, too. They left their bikes in the bike park, collected their tags and made their way to the Great Hall to join the queue to collect their entry envelopes. The longest queue was for the 266 kilometre route. They're mad, said Eric. Outside the hall was a giant board where you could sign your name on the start list, just like the pros did. There was a photographer to take your picture to show off to your family and friends and post on Facebook to bore people. They signed their names. Clovis did an ostentatious and unreadable squiggle. 
just like the pros, he said. There were stalls selling clothing, caps, nutritional products, sunglasses, inner tubes, t-shirts, bidons and other essential stuff. We need ass savers, said Eric. It's going to be wet tomorrow. We don't have mug guards. They found the ass savers and wedged them beneath their saddles. Let's go, said Clovis. The ride back was uneventful and the climb up the final hill was easier than they had thought it would be. Going to be worse tomorrow, said Eric when he reached the top. We want to roll over the start line by eight at the latest, said Clovis. So let's leave the house by 7.30, OK? If you insist. Good night. Make sure you tune in to future stages of the Misspoke podcast if you want to find out what happened to Clovis and Eric on the Liège Baston Liège Sportive. You've been listening to Misspoke, a cycling podcast with me, Julian Hutchings. Hope you've enjoyed it. Make sure you tune in for future episodes.